question number one is in reference with the local government in India. Now the local self-government in India was added by way of two constitutional amendment acts. The 73rd constitutional amendment act is in respect with the local self-government in the rural areas. Whereas the 74th constitutional amendment act is in reference with the urban areas. Now the 73rd amendment act also added the 11th schedule to the Indian constitution which deals with 29 functional aspects of the panchayats. Similarly, the 74th Amendment Act added the 12th schedule to the Indian constitution which deals with 18 functional aspects of the municipalities in the urban area. Please keep in mind that both these functional aspects depend upon the discretion of the state government. That is whether the state government wants to devolve such powers to the local self-government bodies or not. Now the first statement reads, the provisions of local government were added by the constitution 42nd amendment. This is wrong. We know they were added to the 73rd and 74th. Second, 10th, 11th and 12th schedule to the Indian constitution provides for local government. This is also wrong. Only the 11th and the 12th schedule provides for the same. 10th schedule is in respect to the anti-defection laws. Third, Gram Panchayat has the power to refuse allotment of land for commercial purposes. This statement is correct because one of the functions under 11th schedule is in relation to land. Hence, the correct answer to this question would be B3 only. Please have a look at the explanation provided. Question number 2 is asking which of the following best describes the values enshrined in a democratic society. Now this question is more of an understanding based rather than a factual one. Therefore, if our basics about the Indian democracy is clear, we'll be able to attempt this question. Now the first is meaningful participation. We know that one of the features of democracy in India is universal adult franchise, which means that all people above the age of 18 are given the right to vote. And since we know that democracy is a government by the people, it is essential that the common citizens participates in the election process. Hence, meaningful participation would be correct. Second, accountability. Now, ours is a representative democracy. Thus, the members of the government are accountable to the people because it is the people only who elect them in the first place and if they do not fulfill their obligations and duties the citizens would not vote for them in the next election hence this is correct third absolute freedom of expression now we all know that article 191a talks about freedom of speech and expression but we know that such freedom is subjected to certain restrictions given under article 19 clause 2 the third option becomes incorrect because the operative word here is absolute and we know that none of the freedoms under article 19.1 are absolute because they are subject to restrictions given under article 19 clause 2. Fourth is right to dissent which is correct because the right to dissent is a part of your freedom of speech and expression. Hence the correct answer would be C, 1, 2 and 4 only. Please have a look at the explanation given. Question number three asks us to consider three statements. Now these three statements are with respect to the development of system of local governance in the country from the British era. Therefore, to attempt this question, you should have some idea about the historical development of local self-government in the country. The first statement reads, the Charter Act of 1793 established Municipal administration in the three presidency towns of Madras, Calcutta and Bombay. This statement is correct. Second, resolution issued by Lord Ripon in 1882 did not contain provision for local self-government. Now we know that Lord Ripon is very famously called as the father of local self-government in India. Thus, it is very obvious that the second statement has to be wrong 
as his resolution of 1882 was all about local self-government in the areas governed by the British. Third, following the Government of India Act 1919, village panchayats were established in a number of provinces. This statement is correct. Now another way to solve this question is through the technique of elimination. Now if anybody knows this that Lord Ripon was called the father of local self-government, they know that the second statement is wrong. Now if we look at the answer option, we can easily eliminate option number B, C and D because all these three options contain statement 2 as a correct option. Thus, when we eliminate all three, we are only left with A, 1 and 3 only, which is also the correct answer. Please have a look at the explanation to know more about the resolution of Lord Ripon. Question number 4 is asking, which of the following idols and principles can be said to be enshrined with the Gandhian philosophy. Thus, the focus of this question are the principles and idols of local government which Mahatma Gandhi wanted should be employed to manage a village administration. The first is the ideals of village republic. This is correct. The system of governance at the village level should be such that it functions as a republic where the head of the village administration is elected by the people. Second, decentralization of power till the bottom of power hierarchy. This is also correct. Local government means that people at the local level should have a say in the manner in which they want to be governed. Third, self-sustained village economy. This is correct. At the heart of any Gandhian philosophy lies the ideals of self-reliance and self-sustainment, which were very true for a village economy as well. Fourth, participatory democracy. This is also correct. Mahatma Gandhi wanted that every citizen at all levels of government should provide his meaningful participation in the governance of the country. Hence, the correct answer to this question would be D, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Please have a look at the explanation provided. Question number 5 is asking us the reasons why local bodies were initially not a part of the Indian constitution. We know that the local self-governing bodies were added to the Indian constitution in 1992 via the 73rd and the 74th Amendment Act. Hence, they were not a part of the original Indian constitution of 1949. The first statement reads, extreme localism as a threat to unity and integrity of India especially after the partition. This statement is correct because after partition, a lot of areas in the country were under severe turmoil. Second, caste-ridden nature of the rural society. This is also correct because India of that time was deeply entrenched with the caste system, especially in the rural areas. Third, factionalism in Indian society. This is also correct. For a local self-government to be successful, it's very important that all the citizens of that area are living in unity and harmony, which was not the scenario in 1950s. Hence, the correct answer would be D, 1, 2 and 3. Please look at the explanation for more details. Question number 6 is asking us to consider two statements with respect to local government bodies in the country. Now the focus of this question are the various committees and commissions constituted by the government of India to improve and strengthen the functioning of local self-governing bodies in the country. A few of the important committees in the evolution of local self-bodies in the country are Balwantrai Committee. This was the first committee which recommended establishment of a three-tier panchayat system in the country. Second was the Ashok Mehta Committee. Third, G.V. K. Rao Committee. Fourth, L.M. Singhvi Committee. Fifth, P.K. Thangon Committee. Sixth, the Gadgil Committee. Now you do not need to by heart the names of all these committee, but just have a look at them so that you can remember 
with what topic these committees are associated. Now the first statement reads, PK Thangon committee recommended constitutional recognition for local government bodies. This is a correct statement. Second, second administrative reform commission does not provide for local self-governance. This is wrong. The second ARC was set up by the government of India to look into ways to improve the administrative setup in the country. The sixth report of the second ARC deals with local governance. Hence, the correct answer to this question would be A, one only. Please have a look at the explanation. Question number seven is asking us to consider three statements with respect to the Constitution 73rd and 74th Amendment Act. Now the 73rd and 74th Amendment Act gave constitutional status to local self-governing bodies. As per the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act, it was compulsory for all states to have a three-tier Panchayati Raj structure, that is, at village level, intermediate level, and the district level. Now the member of the Panchayat at all three levels were to be elected directly by the people. Under the Act, it was also mandated that all the states should create a Gram Sabha which would comprise of all the adult members who are registered as voters in the electoral rolls of that village. Now this Gram Sabha was in turn to elect the Gram Panchayat. This Gram Panchayat would be elected for a term of five years. Further. The functions and role of this Gram Panchayat would be decided by the state government. Coming to the question, the first statement reads, All states to have a uniform three-tier Panchayati Raj structure. This is correct. Second, mandatory creation of Gram Sabha comprising of all citizens residing in the Panchayat. This is wrong. We have seen that the Gram Sabha comprises of adult members who are registered as voters. Third, the term of each panchayat to be fixed at six years. This is wrong. The term is fixed at five years. Hence, the correct answer to this question would be C, one only. Please have a look at the explanation provided. Question number eight reads, consider the following statements. Number one, all three levels of the Panchayati Raj institutions are elected directly by the people. This statement is correct. The constitution provides that the Panchayat at the village level, block level and the district level will be directly elected by the people themselves. Second, dissolution of state government automatically leads to the dissolution of all Panchayats in the state. We know that the Panchayat is the third level of government in the country and is elected directly by the people. Thus, the Panchayat functions independently of the state government and its election and dissolution has no correlation with the term of the government at the state level. Now further, if the state government dissolves a Panchayat before the end of its five-year terms, then in that case, fresh elections to the Panchayat must be held within six months from the date of such dissolution. This further points to the fact that governance of local bodies is independent of the state government. Thus, the second statement is wrong. Third, reservation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes have been provided at the three levels in proportion to their population. This statement is also correct. Reservation is important to ensure that all segments and sections of the society get proper representation in the governing process. Hence, the correct answer to this question would be C, 1 and 3 only. Please have a look at the explanation for further details. Question number 9 is with respect to the reservation provided at the level of local government in the country. The 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act provides for reservation of seats for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes in proportion of their population 
to the total population in the panchayat area. The reservation for SC and the ST is also applicable in case of offices of the chairpersons at all the three levels of the panchayat. The Act also states that not less than one third of the total number of seats shall be reserved for women, including the number of seats reserved for the women belonging to ST and SC. In this also, one third of reservation for women includes the office of the chairperson. Also remember that this reservation for women is also provided within the seats which are reserved for the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and the backward classes. Coming to the question, the first statement reads, one third of the positions in all panchayat institutions are reserved for women. This is correct. Second, reservation also applies to the position of chairpersons at all the three levels. This is correct. Third, reservation of one third of the seats for women is also provided within the seats reserved for the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and the backward caste. This is also correct. Hence, the right answer to this question is D, 1, 2 and 3. For more information, please look at the explanation. Question number 10 is asking us the features of urban areas as per the census of 2011. As per the census of 2011, the definition of urban area is, firstly, all the places which have a municipality, corporation, cantonment board, etc. Second, all the places which satisfy the following criteria. Firstly, a minimum population of 5,000. Secondly, at least 75% of the male population should be engaged in non-agricultural pursuits. Third, population density of minimum 400 persons per square kilometer. Now the first statement reads, at least 75% of the male working population engaged in non-agricultural occupations. This is correct. Second, density of population of at least 400 persons per square kilometer. This is also correct. Third, minimum population of 5000. This is correct. And lastly, all places with a municipality, corporation, cantonment board or a notified town area committee. This is also correct. Hence, the right answer to this question would be D, 1, 2, 3 and 4 only. For more information, please look at the explanation provided. Question number 11 is asking which among the following can be said to be the positives of local self-government in rural and urban areas. The first is increased people's participation. This statement is correct as the local self-government has provided even the people in villages an opportunity to be part of the election process. Second, increased representation of citizens from minority religions. Now be very careful that this statement is saying minority religions. We know that under the Local Self-Government Act, reservation of seats is provided to the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, backward class and women. Therefore, the representation of all these four has increased. But for minority religions like Sikhs, Muslims, Christians etc, their representation has not increased. Hence, this statement is wrong. Third, women empowerment leading to sensitizing of local issues. This statement is also correct. Women empowerment has been secured by providing one-third reservation to women. Fourth, dependence on state and central government for financial support. Now, this dependence is a drawback of the local self-government, therefore is wrong. Local bodies have very little funds to use and hence their dependence on the central and the state government for financial aid has led to a decrease in their capacity to operate effectively. Hence the correct answer to this question would be 1 and 3 that is A. 
please have a look at the explanation for further clarifications. Question number 12 is asking which of the following features of the Indian constitution have been borrowed from the USA's constitution. We know that the Indian constitution has been inspired by constitution of various other countries. Let us see what all features have been borrowed from the American constitution. The most important feature borrowed from the American constitution are the fundamental rights. Second, independence of judiciary. Third is the concept of judicial review. Fifth is the impeachment of the president. Sixth is the removal of the Supreme Court and High Court judges as well as the post of vice president. Coming to the question, the first is fundamental rights which is correct. Second, idea of residuary power. This is wrong. The concept of residuary power has been borrowed from the Canadian constitution. Third, power of judicial review, which is correct. Fourth, independence of judiciary, which is also correct. Hence, the right answer to this question would be C, 1, 3 and 4 only. Please have a look at the explanation. Question number 13 says, which among the following can be considered as functions of the constitution? This again is an understanding based question which would require one to have a thorough understanding about the constitution of the country. First statement reads, allow for coordination amongst the members of the society. This is right as the constitution provides for fundamental rights and the fundamental duties which govern how the citizens as well as members of a society should interact. Second, to decide who shall make the laws. This is also correct because the constitution lays down the method of the election of the legislature as well as the manner in which it will function. Third, impose limits on the government. This too is correct. The fundamental rights contained in part 3 are the main fetters on the powers of the government. Fourth, fulfill the aspirations of a society. The aspirations of a society are given under the directive principle of state policies which are to act as a guideline when the legislature is making laws for the people of this country. Hence, the right answer to this question would be D, 1, 2, 3 and 4. To know more details, please look at the explanation provided. Question number 14 asks, why is the Indian constitution considered as a living document? To very simply put, a living document is any document which can adapt to the changing needs of the society it caters to. That is, how flexible our Indian constitution is in responding to the challenges of the ever-changing society. Statement A is that it seeks to ensure livelihood to the people. This statement is wrong because ensuring livelihood is nowhere connected to the flexibility of the Indian constitution. B. It strikes a balance between rigidity and flexibility. We will come back to this statement later. C. Inability of the parliament to amend the constitution. Now this is a blanket statement. We know that the parliament in our country has the power to amend the constitution but not those provisions of it which are part of its basic structure. Hence, Statement C becomes wrong. Statement D reads, ability of the parliament to amend all the provisions of the constitution. This again is a blanket statement and is wrong. The operative word here is all. We know the parliament can only amend those features of the constitution which are not part of its basic structure. Coming back to option number B, it strikes a balance between rigidity and flexibility. This statement is correct. Hence, the right answer is B. Please look at the explanation for more information. Question number 15 has been asked in the context of freedom of religion under the Indian Constitution. Now, Article 25 of the Indian Constitution guarantees freedom of religion. According to this article, all persons are equally entitled 
to freedom of conscience and the right to freely profess, practice and propagate religion. But all these freedoms are subjected to public order, morality and health. Coming to the question, the first statement says, right to follow any religion. This is correct. Second, right not to follow any religion. This too is correct. Article 25 gives all the people the freedom of conscience. This freedom of conscience includes a right of a person to follow or not follow any religion. Third, right to propagate any religion. This is also correct. Hence, the right answer is D, 1, 2 and 3. Please have a look at the explanation.